God is perfect. Why? Because he is God. He is wise, generous, loving, and good. He has no sin in him, not one bit. We are not perfect. Why? Because our hearts are sick and dirty with sin. We have all sinned against God. This means we are separated from him and we are born outside of his family. Sin creates a barrier between us and God. It also affects our relationships with others. Sin makes a mess of everything. Yes, everything. And we can't do anything to fix this mess on our own. But because he is gracious and loving, God did something incredible. He sent his son, Jesus, into the world. Jesus lived a perfect life. Yes, totally and completely perfect. What else did Jesus do? In love, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He took the punishment that we deserve, and he made a way for us to know God. Because Jesus died for sin, those who love and trust him can be forgiven, and they can be brought into God's family. Jesus removed the barrier between us and God. So what does this all mean? It means that all the sin that keeps us from a relationship with God and others was taken care of by Jesus. God forgives fully, freely, and forever. And because Jesus forgave us, we forgive others fully, freely, and forever. With you, would you stand with me in reverencing the most holy word of God? I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 23. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had in repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow servant fell on the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that, all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord was moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Real quick, I just want to give you an adjustment to the bulletin this morning. If you have your bulletin out, just put it on the back. I want to give you some information you're going to need soon. Um, as of May 16th, right under my name, our address is now 435 Robin Hood Lane, McMurray, Pennsylvania. So, so God has provided, and it's time to move. Uh, we are actually going to move on Liz Craig's wedding. Liz, I uh, say Liz Craig. <laughs> It's Daniel's wedding, too. So um, Liz and Daniel's wedding, we're moving that day. So we'll need a lot of hands that morning. We'll be pulling in with the truck about 12 uh, p.m. noontime uh, because we have a 4 o'clock wedding to be at here. And, and so if you could show up that day, May 16th, to help us out just for an hour or two, we're, we're going to stop probably. As long as the truck's unloaded, we can always come back and move stuff upstairs or around um, but we need all your help that we can get. That way we can make it really fast. In fact, many hands make everything quick, right? So that's kind of the proverb that we look at. So we, um, we will be moving soon, and uh, we praise God for that. We got an offer in our house for a short sale, and we accepted it. So we're waiting for the bank to say yes to that. And um, so it, we're not out of the woods there. Yeah, praise God. 
We're not out of the woods yet because the, now it's in the bank's hands, and uh, really it's in God's hands, but the bank has to say yes to this, and um, if not, they're not getting a mortgage payment from me ever again. Um, <laughs> And not, not by choice, because I'm one of those guys, like, I'll, I believe in paying my debts. You know, if I make it, I ought to do it. And so, um, but we'll be moving soon and, and really could use your help and prayers to that transition. Uh, we got a house bigger than what we're living in now. I don't even know if we have enough furniture for the whole thing. So, so we'll find out soon enough. Um, it was a God thing. I'll tell you, I, and I know many of us for the past six months, we've had the question, you know, when God, when God, when and believe me, we had the same question going on. We, we were, there were so many times where we'd run into a wall and just not know how in the heck are we going to get here. And every time we tried to, to take a step, a door would slam in our face. And so God has uh, made it away. Um, he's broken my pride enough. I think that's probably what need, really needed to happen was I needed breaking. And uh, he has got us to the place where we're ready to be here and we're ready to do life with you. Um, let me warn you that once we're here, you can't get rid of us means I will show up at your house and eat your food randomly, three o'clock in the morning. That's fine. I wouldn't do that. I would never do that to you, I promise. Maybe two o'clock, but not three o'clock. Um, we are looking forward. There are some really cool things that are going to happen this fall. Okay, we, we, we are putting a plan together. A leadership team and I are putting a plan together. Um, but let me tell you, let me just warn you in front, front end, uh, lots of changes are coming. Okay. Um, Andrea uh, has blessed us for this past year in leading our worship team, and she has decided, that if you were here last week, she has decided to step away from that. She's staying a part of our church. She's going to roll, roll into a new ministry. Oh, I'm really excited for her and what her passions and what God's doing in her life. And just, I, I love it because it's going to fill a void that's about to happen. And, and um, I, can't, I can't let the cat out of the bag yet, but there's going to be some change. And so just be ready, okay? Change isn't always bad. It's hard. It's not, it's not always bad. And sometimes God does change to, he prunes and takes away for the purpose of growth. Any gardeners in here? You understand that? You know, you understand that you start cutting your grass, not in the wintertime, but in the springtime. And the more you cut your grass, as long as it rains, the thicker your grass will become. If you want rose bushes to grow, you're going to trim them back in the spring and fall. And you're going to let those have new life. And so pruning sometimes happens, especially in a church. And I know we don't like that a lot of times, but God shifts people and moves people to new things. And um, and we bless them and we pray for them and ask God to have their hand on them as God shifts things around. But at the same time, God also adds, and he has, and, um, and he's going to continue to do that. And so just know the next six months might be probably the most volatile six months in this church, but it's not that God's mad at us or we're in sin. He is just getting us to a place where he's taking us to a new vision and a new a new era. I'm looking forward to the fall because one of the things, and I'll let the cat out of the bag here this morning, one of the things in the fall we're going to do is we're going to open, start small groups back. The reason why I'm glad for small groups is because one of the things that we need to do is do life together. We need to, to spend time with each other outside of these walls. It's really hard to know someone or to know how to carry their weight or you know, carry their burdens if you don't spend any more than an hour and a half to two, hour, two and a half hours on a Sunday. And so we're going to start small groups, and, and uh, we're going to launch. We've already got a couple small groups, we're small group leaders that we're talking to right now, and I will, in the process of this summer, be walking through with them what, we, what will those will look like. The great thing about the small groups is we're not going to dictate from the top what you're going to learn or, or even talk about. A lot of times a small group leader will have the freedom to say, hey, let's set a lesson aside and let's just deal with this issue. And so we want to make the small groups really a life-flowing group for you to be a part of. And so there are going to be several opportunities. My wife's praying about doing a ladies' one. Um, I know we're going to do a young married one in our house. Uh, I know there's several couples here that haven't been married real long that we'd love to just do life with you guys or some that are getting married soon, some that, are, that have uh, not given me a date. I'm not talking about anybody in particular, Mikey. Um, but, you know, just... <laughs> People that need to do life with each other, and so uh, there'll, there'll be a, um, I'm not going to say mid-age married, because I'm mid-age, so I don't like that word. Uh, there's going to be another married couple, one, and there's going to there's be, a, we're going to try to do it where your walk of life, you can do life with a group of people, and, and see where God is taking you together. Uh, there are, unofficially, because uh, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but what I've seen in this church, there are about 150 to 175 people that call FCC Elder Home. Uh, if they were here all at the same time, we'd have to go to a second service. And so, you know, all these empty seats are just people on vacation or doing whatever they need to do. Um, but in that, how do you get 175 people 
to love each other and to see eye to eye and to stay within the vision at the same time, to share Christ and, and impact their world. And you do it by doing life together. And so that's coming. So pray about how, you know, how you'd want. We'll, we'll roll those out all at the same time. We'll have descriptions. We'll have a Sunday where we'll talk about it. And then uh, we'll gradually start them off. And then all of a sudden we'll have a launch day. And what we're hoping is that they'll grow quickly where we can start more. So we don't want a small group to be like 50 people in somebody's house. So you might like that, but that's pretty much a church. And so if that happens, we're going to have to start planting churches in new areas. Um, which I know, a little scary, uh, but hey, God, God's got us where he wants us. Okay, trust that. All right, so I've wasted our last nine minutes talking about small groups, but let's, let's move forward. Um, this morning, we're going to continue the discussion on the reality of the forgive, forgiveness of sins that Christ has given us in Colossians chapter 1. And as we've taken, what, the last two, three months, we've looked at seven identities that God has given us. And let me, if I can remember correctly, here we go. That one is that we are a saint, no longer a sinner. That Christ calls us, has a new name, a new place for us. That he calls us someone who is set aside for his work in Colossians, in the beginning of Colossians 1. That we're in a vineyard for the gospel in Colossians 1 through uh, 6 through 9. That... When gospel, when Christ is planted in us, when the Holy Spirit's given to us, there's a work that's going to happen, that's going to continuously happen. It's a reality in every Christian that the God is growing the gospel in you. If he's not growing the gospel in you, the question is one of two things. God, am I yours? Or God, what am I missing? Okay, that's, that's where we, we come to the place. And I don't want to always assume that people are lost when, when, you know, when they're not growing spiritually because I think we can become very legalistic in that and put, kind of hammer people with the cross. And I don't, want to, I don't want you to ever feel like I've got a hammer in here that looks like the cross and beating you over the head. What, what I want us to do is see that the gospel is very necessary for daily application. And so when we see that God has planted the work of the gospel to grow in us, that means that he is working in every Christian's life every single day to make them more like his son and to get them to the place where he finally will, will uh, finish his work and take us home. We also see that Christ has given us uh, the qualification to fit in, with the inheritance of saints of light, mainly that he's made us fit for heaven, that God did the work, to, that we were unfit, that he did the work on the cross to make us fit for heaven. There was no way we were getting in. There was no way we could be called a saint unless Christ did that on the cross for us. And so the Father's work through the cross, through his Son, was to make us fit for heaven. Those of us that are in spring, you're realizing how unfit you might be. Um, I say just for myself, because uh, my wife and I have just made a commitment for the last few months to, really, to just eat better and to work harder. And um, Friday night we had our cheat night. And can I tell you, Chinese food's really bad for you. So that was a 1,200 calorie meal. I haven't had 1,200 calories in a meal in a long time. So Mary, Mary Chesley, Marie Chesley just choked on herself over there. So, yeah. but um, you know, I, we look at how you know this being fit that God has has put us in this place where we fit in His pl- in His realm. We fit in His kingdom, and we were unfit for His kingdom. We were unqualified for his kingdom. Then we see the fact that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. That not only has he once and for all rescued us, pulled us out of darkness, but he continues to do that in the Christian's life. Christian, there's a lot of things that happen in our lives that we don't know that God is rescuing us from. Um, and I love, I love the, he's not much of a theologian, but I call him a theologian because he has one line and one song that I can always respect. Garth Brooks, I thank God for unanswered prayers. How many prayers have we begged God for that he hasn't given us? And we look back and we go, thank you, Lord, for not giving that to us. And so um, there are several people in my life that God's taken out, and I praise him for that. Nobody here. Okay, don't, don't, don't think that's about you. But I just praise him that there are certain people that, uh, that, that God did not continue my, in my life because it would have been very deadly for my life. And so God is continuing to rescue us. Not only has he rescued us, but he's continuing to do that. And... In the process, he transferred us to himself, to the kingdom of his beloved son, that, that he reached down into darkness and pulled us to himself. So these are all truths that never go away, by the way. That, that's, why, that's why we're preaching on these. It's not that we, think of that we think of them and we go, oh, that's a cute truth, or that's a nice truth. These are the reality that every Christian possesses in this room. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a saint, you are a growing place for the gospel, you have been rescued and are continuing to be rescued, you, you have been transferred to king, in the kingdom of his beloved son, and a couple weeks ago you have been redeemed, which means that he has paid the price, he has 
taken the debt away from you that you owe, that we had earned through our sin. And, as we looked last week, he's forgiven us. He's removed the wall out of our way between our relationship and his. Forever, we're his. Last week, I finished with this point. People that are, haven't been forgiven much, forgive much. Why do we need to be forgiven? Well, because sin. And if we describe sin, we will see that sin is usually rooted in self-sufficiency. It's usually rooted in the place where we think we have to do A, B, or C, or we think that there's something that we must do to gain God's approval or God's favor. There are so many self-help books in the world today about how to be a better person, how to be a better Christian, how to be a better husband, a better wife, how to be a better boyfriend, a better girlfriend. There are so many things that talk about how to make yourself better when the realization is that's what got us in trouble in the first place. So the question I ask a lot of people when they're like, well, I've read this self-help book and I read this, I'll ask them, so how's that working out for you? You know, one of the things Michelle and I have made a commitment to is we're, we're trying to get out of debt. And you know, what, you know what debt usually means? Is I'm not willing to wait on God for something. I'll just, I'm just talk about my own sin right here because I'm in debt because most of the stuff we're in debt about is not emergency stuff. There's some debt we have that's emergency. Like we had to fix the van and, and we'll have to fix it again here soon, you know. But most of our debt's because I was, one, was unwilling to wait. Self-sufficiency you'll see that every sin is rooted in self. It's rooted in an action that we thought we had to do something apart from God. And so we needed that barrier to be removed. Why? Because God created us to be total, have total reliance on him. God created us to have a relationship where we are trusting him for everything. That we are thanking him for all the blessings he does give us and thanking him for the blessings that he doesn't give us and that we, we are relying on him for not just finances and job or, but, or, or for significance, but for relationships. Guys, you think about two people getting married and you think about the opposite end of that spectrum that they are, okay? And you think, how in the heck does a marriage work? You got two people that have been living self-sufficiently all their life and then they come together and they have to start relying on each other, checking in with each other. Heck, sleeping in the same bed together? You know, for the, uh, no, here's, here's another one, Mark. You mind if I share this? Okay, so my wife gives me the okay. For the first month, we didn't sleep in the same bed. I'd wait for her to fall asleep and I'd go sleep on the couch. I couldn't handle anybody touching me. It was like, it's like, oh, okay. and even now, like when Haley was born, she'd stick her, her hand up our sleeve, and she wouldn't, she's one of these touchy-feely kids. She wouldn't let you go anywhere. I couldn't handle it. Like, I literally could not handle people touching me in my, like, when I sleep, leave me alone, okay? Leave me alone. And, and I wonder, it's such a beautiful picture to see happily married couples, because you see that not only have they gotten all their other issues kind of settled or they're working through that, but they can even be in the same bed and just, and even, good night, you know, and roll over or whatever. You know, the, you know the most beautiful thing that we ever did in our marriage? Buy a king-size bed. It was beautiful. And I look at her and say, hey, she's in a different zip code over there. I'm really enjoying it. She, but then Nathan messes it up and sleeps sideways, and then, then I'm back on this much bed. You know, the, the beauty is, though, that when you have two people with different lives come together, and guys, not just different lives, but different issues, because we bring our junk into marriage. We bring our mess into marriage. Like, there, there's, no, there's no two people you get, you know, we might look at them and go, oh, man, that's just a perfect couple, but they're not perfect people. They've messed up. They, they, they've done things in their lives that they regret, and when you put that together, it can do one of three things. It can be beautiful. It can be one of those marriages like, eh, they sit in front of the TV all their life and just put up with each other. Or it can be war. And when people come into that marriage and apply the truth that, hey, I'm messed up before I got married and I'm probably still a little messed up as I'm married, and they give each other grace and they apply their past to their present, it gives them a beautiful future. That's the beauty of the gospel. 
when we as Christians apply the fact that we had broken God's law, that we had lived a self-sufficient life and still today struggle with self-sufficiency, all right? Any control freaks in here? Thank you. If you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. <laughs> Somebody's like, I'm not raising my hand. Control freak. <laughs> Did you get it? Some of y'all will get that on the way home. Oh, man, you got me, you know. When we live self-sufficiently, we sin. Before we knew Christ, there was a wall called sin in between our relationship with Jesus. We could not have a relationship with God because of that sin. The cross took that out of the way. The problem is, the American church can be one of the most unforgiving places in, in the world. We love to shoot our wounded. Anybody been there? Anybody like, man, somebody's hurting and you're just piling on the, the problems? Oh, don't, don't talk to so-and-so. They did this, this, and this. You know, they're already in pain. They're falling in sin because they're in pain. And we just want to separate ourselves from them. Or we want to talk bad about them. Or, or we want to put undue stress on someone <clears throat> or put things on people that God would never put on them. Unfortunately, that's kind of the mantra of the American church. And I'm not saying every church is like that. And I'm not saying that's kind of how we operate. But I'm just saying that that's kind of what the church has been known for for the past few years. Is not a place of grace and forgiveness, but a place of judgment and a place of harshness. I believe the reason why the church has become that is because we have forgotten who we were before we were the church. And that happens because we don't take a daily application of the gospel and allow it to penetrate and change our hearts and lives. We, we can be, and I say we because I'm in that boat too, we can be harder on church people than we can be someone who is lost and is dying. But shouldn't we be the most forgiving place in the world? You know, Disneyland's the, the happiest place in the world. Shouldn't we be the most forgiving place in the world? That happens because the truth we talked about last week is not being daily applied. I shared with you my testimony last week about at 11 years old being uh, molested by my cousin and uh, what it kind of just did to me. Do you know holding on to, uh, holding on to that kind of pain makes you do one of two or three things? You can go into depression. Some of us in this room, if we'd be honest, we struggle with depression. Probably rooted because of something someone did to us or someone has said about us or, or that, that has have walked through, um, you know, maybe have denied us something. You can go through rage where you lose it at every moment, that, that you're just a ticking time bomb. Anybody know those people? I know those people. I'm, I'm that person sometimes, you know. There are days where I know my wife looks in my eyes and goes, okay, I'm going to stand over here, you know. This, we know that, but I don't mean to make light of that, but there, there are those people that when, when you've been hurt, you're just a ticking time bomb. But this is where most of us struggle. This is where it always lies. Bitterness. We become bitter people. We become hardened people. Because someone's hurt us, and we're unwilling to apply the same forgiveness given to us to them. That's where I was when I was singing that David Crowder song, Deliver Me, getting ready to lead 150 students in worship that night for a student weekend. And God gave me four phrases to put in that song. Hopefully one day I'll get to share those things with you. But I was a bitter person. As a pastor, well, probably 10 years at that point, I was bitter and angry. Or eight years at that point, I was bitter and angry, and mean, and judgmental, and it was all rooted because I would not apply the same forgiveness given to me to others. When you will apply the gospel to your personal life, it becomes very dangerous for you. And I mean dangerous. Why? And guys, right now I'm so ahead of my notes. So don't worry about it. We're, we'll, we'll get in there, okay? We'll, we'll, I know some of you guys are filling the blank types of people. We'll get there, okay? It's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because it allows you to be hurt. It allows you to be hurt. 
Who said it? Let me get this quote for you. You're going to want this quote. That's who I thought it said. Tim Keller said, forgiveness is absorbing pain, not afflicting it. Isn't that the beauty of the cross? Isn't that the beauty of what Jesus Christ did for us? He absorbed our pain. He absorbed what we should have taken. He took it for us. But when we forget that, it is so easy for us to become bitter, angry people. You might be bitter this morning and not even know it. But if you're, if you're bitter this morning, if you're holding on to something, it's probably because you've been hurt and you're having a hard time letting it go. Do you know what? I think there, and here's your notes. There are three reasons why I believe people struggle with receiving or applying forgiveness or even giving it. Okay? Number one, legalism before salvation. I think we struggle with giving forgiveness and, and, and receiving forgiveness and applying forgiveness to our everyday lives because we didn't come to Christ because of what Christ did. We came to Christ about what we have done. We've lived a good enough life, or we kept all the rules, or we didn't go see that movie. You know, we didn't go listen to Run DMC when they're in concert. You know, we didn't go see Terminator Two or Four or Five Hundred, whichever one it was. You know, we 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 didn't read all those books. We didn't we didn't listen to to those people. We separated ourselves. We were good people, and so we come to church just to get our church fixed, get our God fix on. And before we really came to Christ, we kind of lived in this self reliant lifestyle. Or, the flip side of that is we didn't think we were bad enough for God to forgive us. We didn't think we've done anything that needed forgiving. You ever, you ever, you ever around somebody like that? Man, they're, I've been around people, they're just jerks. I'm, okay, I'm just going to speak plainly for a second. You know, those guys that, they're just mean. They're like, and and you, you come to this place like, oh, man, I'm not going to let you have this over me. I'm going to forgive you. like, forgive me? What do I need to be forgiven for, man? I'm, I'm the best. You know, they're almost like, they're, they're arrogant about it. I think sometimes that's what we as Christians, we're almost arrogant about our sin. Like, well, it was just a lie. Or it was, it was just five bucks. They weren't going to miss that. And we don't apply the realization that the wrath of God had to come down on the Son of God to forgive our sins. Yes, the little white lie, Charles Manson. The problem with legalism before, and even the second one, legalism after salvation, is it's rooted in self, and it's rooted in wrong comparisons to other people. We don't see ourselves like Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, Saddam Hussein, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, we don't see ourselves in that boat when it comes to our sin. We, we, we see ourselves in a nice little American Sunday school church. The kids are, oh, they're so sweet. How many parents would, would, ha, are sick of hearing how sweet your kids are some days? No, I'm just like, my kids are great. But there are days where you're going, oh, if you only knew. Yeah, parents? All right. I hit a nerve there because a lot of people are like, oh, yeah. You know, some, some that don't have kids are like, oh, yeah. You know, I've been there. You know, I've watched that kid. Somebody's kids are in here and they're trying not to do that to their child now. But you have that moment where people are like, oh, your kids are so great. And you're like, you should have seen them in the car five seconds ago. They were almost dead. <laughs> we have that picture of ourselves. We cannot make light work of the cross. Amen. We cannot make light work of it. Can I give you a description of the cross just for a second? So 39 whippings. The cat of nine tails was nine foot long. Nine foot long. I know we have, you know, there are some people say three, some say six. Nine feet long is what the Roman garrison would have used. In each one of those nine strands of nine foot long leather, there would have been tied nails, rocks, glass, and anything sharp that they could have had. At the end of it, there were hooks that looked like fingers like this on each one. And so when they would whip a, a, a prisoner, 
they would reach out, and it was a long, because you have to get that nine feet of, of rope to come around, and they would grab, and it would literally wrap around the person and lock in to their flesh. And then they would yank. And anything it was locked in with would get torn wide open. 39 times Christ dealt with that. Then he dealt with a 150, foot, 150 pound beam put on his shoulder as he had to carry it miles through the city streets being mocked up on a hill where eventually they'd lay him down. Now I love our cross but it's not exactly correct. Most of the times the nails weren't through the front of the feet. It's through the side on the heel. There wasn't a platform that they stood on. There was actually a platform they sat on. Do you know what they did with that platform for males? They nailed something to that platform. You can't look at the cross and make light of your own sin. And you know the other thing? We can't look at the cross... And be mean to other people. It's an impossibility. When you look at the work of the cross. And you realize that was me that should have been up there. You can't come to a place where it says I've earned my salvation. Or legalism after salvation. Which means I got in through Christ. But now I live by this self-reliant rules. This self-reliance. This self-centeredness. This, I've got to do A, B, and C, and this is how God gives me favor. The way you got in is the way you stay in, and that's grace. So we have a hard time applying forgiveness and giving forgiveness a lot of times because we lived in this way that we didn't need Christ really before we got saved, or, or we went to church and we did all the good things, so we earned our way in, or we didn't think we were bad enough, or once we're in, we forget how bad we really were. And we forget that we're still capable of that. I, I don't know. What, a lot of Christians think once we got saved, like this magic button got pushed, and like we're never going to sin again. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Man, there would be a lot of pain that wouldn't be in my life if that if there was that magic button. You know, if Staples was true, and we had that easy button to hit. Man, I'd be hitting that sucker every second of the day. Oh, I got to go to the gym for two hours? Easy button, sweet. You know, oh, my wife and I have conflict? Easy button, sweet. I, I don't like my kids very much right now. Oh, those go to the room. You know, it's playing easy buttons. You know, it's, that, that doesn't happen in the Christian's life. Let's just be real. We struggle. We struggle with everyday life, and we still have struggle with sin. Why? Because we live in this body of flesh that remembers the sin life you used to be in. There are patterns built into your life. They don't go away. The day they go away is when you're with God in heaven forever. That's why we so long for it. There are days I wake up and go, God, I just wish today was the day. Today would be a great day. I know some of you right now, you're, you're, you're thinking about your week. And if you could pay God enough money to end it this week, you would come up with that money. If you could somehow convince God, make this the week, in fact, five minutes before what I've got to go to, You'd be shelling big bucks out right now. You realize that this world is not your home. And it's not as painful. And it's hard to deal with. We struggle, guys. So we signed that lease on Wednesday. And it's been all out war since then. War. I'm sitting in my office going, what the heck is going on? Why is it such a rough week? We did what God told us to do. We put our house on the market. We signed the contract for it to sell it. We signed the lease to be here. We started our rental process on our truck and, and to get, get, get everything moved here. And like everything's falling into place. But man, it has been war. And I realized real fast, God didn't promise me easy. He promised me peace. Peace doesn't come when you don't apply the gospel. Forgiveness is not easy to give when you don't apply the gospel. We struggle because we forget that there's still a struggle. The third thing I see in your notes of why we have a hard time giving and receiving forgiveness and applying is you have a wrong view of God. 
God is more of, of your caretaker or more of your sugar daddy than he is God. One of the things God really pierced in my heart this week is I need to spend more time studying who he is and how he responds to things. And that will really bring light to the gospel. So next week, my, I don't know how long he'll have me, but I'm going through the Old Testament and looking at everything that God says, this is who I am. And every time a, a, a scriptural writer says, this is who God is, and I'll ask the question, God, what does that mean? And this is something I do in my, in my own personal time, and I encourage you, if you're having a hard time having a personal time with God in the Word, two questions asked. What does this say about you, God, and then what's it say about me? And you can spend a lot of time in those two questions. A lot of time with God in those two questions. And who knows? It might birth a sermon series, or it might just free me from the war I'm in right now. But a lot of times, we have a hard time giving, receiving, or applying forgiveness because we simply have a wrong view of God. And this is how it usually plays out, especially in the church. There are some people, and this is what we think, there are some people that will never be forgiven. Now, there's a theological battle going on over that right now. But let's give it to an application for our personal lives. We look at people and we simply say, that person will never receive forgiveness from God, or secondly, forgiveness from me. We have been hurt so bad, or we're so upset and angry, that we're unwilling to give grace. Or maybe not unwilling, maybe we just can't. Anybody been there before? Like, it's not, you want to, but you just can't get over. The pain is too bad. There, there's something greater is going to have to happen out of your life for you to get past the pain, to offer that person forgiveness, or offer those people forgiveness, or offer, offer a situation, that situation forgiveness, or even worse, offer yourself forgiveness. A lot of us struggle because we can't even forgive ourselves. We, we don't think God's big enough to forgive what we're not forgiving. We become God in our own life. And we hold on to past pain, and we hold on to past mistakes, and we say, I can't forgive myself, or I will not forgive myself. And simply what we're saying is, God, you're not big enough to forgive that situation. It's a wrong view of God. Do you know that our worship is always founded on our view of God? How we worship God is always founded on how, what we think about him. If we have grand thoughts of him, we tend to have grand worship. And, and worship's not just music, okay? Let, let's not just plant that it's always about music. Worship's in everything. Your job, your marriage, the way you lead your children, the way you, your friend, the, the, way you, the way you spend your money. Those are all things of worship. Those are all things that you get to tell God how great he is. But if you have a little view of God, you're going to act like God's little. You're going to act like God is limited in what he can do. Forgiveness is one of those things that we have to see how big God is. Especially in our own lives when we struggle with forgiving ourselves. Man, there are things I've done in my life that I will regret to the day I'm in heaven. And the only reason I will not regret those things anymore is because I'm praying he will wipe the regret away. There are things that I've done to myself that we, cele we, you know, we celebrate certain things during the year and I look back and I go, oh, that's just a constant reminder of the stupidity I lived in. And it becomes hard to apply forgiveness then. Forgiveness is applied because we have a right view of God. Chuck Swindoll says, bitterness either replaces forgiveness or forgiveness replaces bitterness. They cannot coexist. You cannot live a life that is bitter and forgiving at the same time. It's impossible. 
the only way we get to the place where bitterness is removed is when we see what Tim Keller said. And, we, and we're willing to absorb pain. We're willing to allow God to absorb the pain he's done. In fact, let me give you this. Like, Matt Chandler says this about forgiveness. The forgiveness that is assertive, sacrificial, and resurrects relationship is originated by God. Let me say that again. The forgiveness that is assertive, sacrificial, and resurrects relationship is originated by God. The only thing that will help you get past that pain is God himself. There are things that people have done to you or you've done to yourself, and the only way you're going to receive that pain is if God does that for you. See, that's the beauty of being a Christian. It's not about us mustering up forgiveness. It's not about us hitting ourselves over the hammer with a cross saying, let me hit myself on the head again too, so I can come to the place where I forgive people. It is allowing God to do the power that only God can do through your life. If you're having a hard time forgiving, you need God to do it. You need to beg God, God, I don't want to forgive this person. Just be honest with him. God, I can't forgive this person. Or God, I will not forgive this person. You need to come to that place. Or maybe it's you. God, I will not forgive myself. I can't forgive myself. I need you. That's faith. That's why the opposite of faith is sin, according to Romans 14, 23. That we've become this place. I hear a lot of people say, I've got to forgive people. Yes, but not because that's originated out of you. It's because the gospel is birthed in your life, a spirit of forgiveness. The only way you get to a dangerous place of forgiveness is when Christ is living his life through you. Let me, let me share with you a situation that happened recently, not in this church, but in the world. So, everybody remember, well, I think it was about a month or two ago, it's right, up, right before I got off Facebook. Um, 20 Coptic Christians were killed in Egypt. I don't know if you guys saw the pictures, but there were 20 men, they were tied and their hands were tied, they were on their knees, there were ISIS standing behind them with masks, you know, with knives and guns acting all big and bad, yeah, like, some of us want to go, I'll show you what big and bad is with an M16 in my hand, no saying okay that was me that might not be you but they beheaded them on live tv okay it was all across the world in a recent tv show in the middle east a christian tv show there were two brothers that were beheaded by isis one of the brothers called into the tv show some of y'all guys might have seen this already can i read to you part of the transcript of that call so the, the uh, commentator saying, hey, man, we pray for you. God bless you. We hope you're doing all right. And he says this. The brother says this. I thank ISIS because they didn't cut the audio when they screamed declaring their faith. It strengthened mine. He went on when, when he was asked, well, what do you think about the government's response? Do you think that was good? Do you think that was fair that, that the government came and bombed people? And he goes, the government airstrikes were good but we wouldn't have cared for any retaliation. When asked this question, would you or anyone in your family get upset if anyone asked, if anyone outside of your family, if they asked God to forgive ISIS and save them? This is, what he was, this is what he said about his mother. Today I was having a chat with my mother asking her what she would do if she saw one of ISIS members on the street. And she said this, I'm repeating it honestly, not because I'm on air. She said she would invite him into her home because he helped us enter the kingdom of heaven. She's an uneducated woman of 60 years. I asked her, what would you do if you see one of those ISIS members passing on the street? And I told you, that's the man who killed your son. She said, I will ask for God to open his eyes and ask him in our house because he helped us enter the kingdom of God. Then the brother had the gall to pray for the salvation of those men and ISIS. That's when forgiveness is radically applied. That's when forgiveness becomes danger. This only happens when you have received and applied the gospel of Jesus Christ to your life. In your notes, God's re receiving God's forgiveness for your sin will produce a forgiving heart towards others. When God lives inside of you, God's going to get outside of you. If God is in you, you're going to struggle if you hold back what God wants to do. 
William Mount says this, also the divine initiative in the forgiveness of sins creates a forgiving spirit in the life of the Christian. So I put three things in there that what forgiveness will produce in you. Number one, received and applied grace in you will, circle that word will, produce or produce grace given to others. When God has given you grace, and you apply grace, the natural outcome of that will be you giving grace. When you apply forgiveness, you receive forgiveness, the natural outcome of that will be you giving forgiveness. Number two, it's already in there. You'll find a joy to forgive and see others taste that forgiveness. When the gospel has captured your heart, you want to see others taste forgiveness. You want to see others know forgiveness. You want to see others no God. And then the third thing, when forgiveness, what forgiveness will produce in you? Christ's life in you. You'll see Christ come out of you in the weirdest, strangest moments. Instead of getting mad a lot of times, you'll get Jesus. Instead of wanting to hurt somebody, you want to give more Jesus. And as I said last week, people that have been forgiven much, forgive much. Now, I was going to play a video for you guys real quick. I don't have time for that video, but we're going to look, let's look again in Matthew 18. I want to show you what happens when you don't apply forgiveness. I want to show you what kind of lifestyle the Christian lives, and we've already read the scripture this morning, but I want to show you just for the next few moments, and we'll finish up. What happens when a person is self-sufficient or... What's the word I used last week? Man, I can't think of it. Self-saving? You know, just kind of protecting themselves. Verse 21 in Matthew 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. Now, now see this. Peter's not asking. Are, are we, this is where we over-spiritualize it. We think, man, Peter's asking a really spiritual question like, and how can forgiving am I when, when I am sinned against seven times? I think we can over-spiritualize this. You know what Peter's doing? He's protecting himself. God, he's really asking Jesus, how much is enough? How much is enough? How many times do I forgive when I don't have to forgive anymore and I can protect myself? I can remove that person and remove myself. And he says seven times. The reason why it's seven times here, there are two rabbinical thoughts here. One was, one was you could forgive a person three times, and the fourth, they, they can't be forgiven anymore. You're supposed to remove them out of the relationship, even stone them to death sometimes, bring them to court, whatever. Or the other one was four times, that you would forgive them four times and no more after that. Well, Peter does the spiritual thing here, right? I'm going to put them together. How great am I? Jesus, seven times. He's protecting himself. He, the, question is how, the question is not how do I forgive. The question is how do I protect myself. That's the question. You know what Jesus says? Not seven times. Seventy by seven. Not times seven. You know how much that is? 490. You know what's significant about 490? I think by 236 you've forgotten what you're mad about. Maybe 315. You got to the place where, what am I forgiving the person for? We, there's a problem we have. Jesus says, forgiveness is something that doesn't stop. That's dangerous. Because in our American psychological Christianity, we think there are times where we tell people, and I'm not saying not to, I'm just saying there are times we tell people to get out of a situation when God hasn't let them get out of that situation yet. We're more interested in what Oprah and Dr. Phil says about Christianity than what we are about the Bible. Being a Christ follower is dangerous, people. He'll do strange things like put you on a 115 degree day on a hot tin roof. And almost give you a heart attack the next week. He'll take you to places where you'll sell all your possessions, not knowing if you'll ever come back to the land you once called home. He'll have friends in your life that you don't understand how they're, how they're your friends, but all of a sudden you get it one day when they turn to Jesus. 
He'll let you get molested at 11 years old. It's a hard world. I'm not making light of this world. What I'm saying is, we have a sovereign king. And he has purposes for what he does. Do you realize if God didn't let me get molested, there are about a thousand people I know of today that wouldn't be free from sin. Students that I've preached to, men, women, young boys, young girls that I've sat across my table from that were dying inside. They were literally wanting to take their lives because they felt like filth. And I shared my testimony with them. You know what happened? God freed them. He said, that's not fair. Oh, yeah? Why did he sell, have Joseph sold off in slavery? Why did he have Potiphar's wife lie about Joseph? and have? Why? Because he has a plan. Trust him. He has a plan. Pain is part of the process sometimes. In here, Peter goes, when can I self-preserve? And Jesus says, you don't self-preserve. And then he goes through this parable. Let me just walk through this parable real quick. We already read it. Verse 23 he, and 24, he talks about how there's this king that decides to settle the things for his slaves. Bill, will you go get John? He's got to come up next. Um, the king that was going to settle things for his slaves. And so he finds a slave in verse 25, and the slave didn't have the money to settle it. 10,000 talents. Let's just, let's just put a number on there, $100 million. Okay? So the slave fell to the ground because the king was going to sell off him, his family, and everything he owned and get rid of the, the slave. All right? So the slave falls to the ground in verse 25 or 26 and begs the king. And this is, this is something we have to see. Look at this. This is, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. Wrong question. He's never going to be able to repay $100 million. He's a slave. That's why he's a slave in the first place. A lot of times slaves were slaves because they had a debt they could not pay and sold themselves into slavery so that they could get free from that debt. He has to work it off. Only, there's only one person that can forgive that debt, the king. The beauty of verse 26 is the king felt compassion and forgave it all. Do you realize that that word compassion is used mainly to one character in the New Testament? Jesus. Over and over it says that Jesus felt compassion on them. He felt compassion on this person. He felt compassion with this person. You know what the word compassion means? A deep felt pain for that person. The king felt compassion. He forgave his debt. Salvation came to this person. Well, let me show you what happens when you don't apply the gospel to your life. Verse 27. So he forgave him. Verse 28, he went out and he found a fellow slave who owed him 10 bucks. And he beat that slave down and threatened to sl- throw that slave into jail. Just got forgiven 100 million. Why? Because he forgot forgiveness. He forgot what was already applied to his personal life. And when you don't apply what's been given to you, you tend to self-preserve. And we see that later on, the king finds out, he brings a slave back, and I want you to see this, because this is a lesson we have to look at in reality and truth this morning, especially as Christians. Verse 32, Then suddenly to him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Verse 34, And, and his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all those owed him. Verse 25, 35, my heavenly father will do the same to you if each one of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Let me tell you what that's, this is saying. It's not saying that you lose salvation because what happens? He goes from being sold away from the kingdom to being forgiven, being placed in the kingdom forever, to being beaten. Why? Because he's still in the kingdom. The book of Hebrews says that God disciplines his sons because he loves them. The slave couldn't pay back what was owed. His debt was forgiven. But the king had to teach him to live in forgiveness. I think some of us, the pain we're dealing with is because the king is trying to teach us to live in forgiveness. Some of the pain we deal with is self-inflicted. But some of it is God-inflicted. I know that's not the message we like to hear. That's not a feel-good story. That's not what we walk in and go, man, this makes me feel ooshy-gushy inside. Thanks, Pastor Sean. I just want to cuddle right now. But the reality is, 
God's saying, if you will not let my life come out of you, I will do what is ever necessary to love people through you. And sometimes that's painful. Sometimes that's torturous. When we are unwilling to allow God to live his life through us. My mentor Paul Gotthard says this often, Sean, learn the lesson the first time because the second time is going to hurt. The third time might kill you. God loves us enough to not allow us to be unforgiving people. But better yet, God loves his name enough to not allow his name to be defamed just because we're stubborn children. Sometimes the pain we deal with is our lack of grace and forgiveness. And I'm not going to talk about the rest of the church, but when people come to Faith Community Church Lakeside, or Faith Lakeside as we just like to call it, maybe we should be FLC too, I don't know. They should taste grace. They should taste grace. Not because we're gracious people, but we have a gracious God that lives through us. Not because we muster up forgiveness, but because we've been forgiven much. When you apply the forgiveness of sins to your life, you can't help to forgive people. Are you struggling with forgiveness this morning? I know some of us are. I know some of us are dealing with pain. I'm not telling you to muster through that. I'm telling you go to God and let Him do it. You, You don't need another five steps of forgiveness sermon, what you need is allow Jesus to live his life through you. Because only he can do it. Only he can give you the compassion for the person who has wronged you. Now here's the deal about forgiveness too. When you forgive somebody, you have to tell them what they did wrong. It'd be ludicrous. Like I told told you guys last week, I can't just walk up to Todd and go, hey, I forgive you. And Todd's like, what did I do? And there's been nothing done. If someone's hurt you, the process of restoration starts with you forgiving them, but also starts with you saying, you've done this. Now, whether they repent or not, that's a whole different story. You know, the, you know Christ took the cross without us repenting. Let the gospel transform your life. Instead of an invitation time this morning, I just want you to take that piece of paper home. There's a personal application sheet there. And just take this week to write out, God, what are you saying to me about this sermon? Are there things in my life? Are there things in other people's lives? How do I apply what was just said to me? You know the beauty about this sermon? Is Erica records these things, and if you need to watch it again, you can. You can torture yourself for another 50 minutes every week. We're there. Let me pray for us, and then I'm going to transition to Bill. Father, thank you so much for this morning. God, thank you for your love for us. God, I just pray that we would be a people of forgiveness. God, I pray that there, there are people in here that have never lived a life of forgiveness, Father Lord, that they've never received your forgiveness. God, today would be a great day. Father Lord, let them know that you have wiped away the wall in between them and you. And that you love them and you want to be a part of them. But they have to recognize who they were before you came knocking on their door. God, I pray even now they're saying, God, forgive me for what I've done. God, I don't want the barrier. I want you. I want a relationship with you. I want to be yours forever. Do whatever you want with me. God, I pray for us in this room that are are Christians that are having a hard time with forgiveness, God, that we would not go try to muster up forgiveness, but God, that just as Matt Chandler says, that it's a forgiveness originated by you, God, that we let you do the work through our lives. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.